because I really loved seeing these projects that came out of the open source creative coding community being appropriated in this other context for educational, um, emotional experiences that sort of reveal something about humanity as a whole um, intersect. So at that time I was working at a startup, um, getting really into the tech scene and um, really curious about what was happening in the cultural sector with how they were implementing these new tools like social media, iPads, iPhone apps, like what were they doing with them? Um, and I started sort of investigating that and um, facilitating conversations about it through these like meetups, um, which eventually sort of led me into the museum sector, um, led to a position at MoMA in the digital learning um, department, and um, kind of allowed me to think about how we can democratize access to the arts through technology. Um, just make it, I just, what I admire most about Paula is the way that she um, contextualizes these things and the way that she thinks about them in this larger uh, frame of view that makes them, I don't know, seem even more significant than, than I already believe them to be. Um, and she's been really instrumental in terms of bringing um, this sort of creative coding type of work, data viz, into the museum setting. Um, in, you know, you could say that they come from like different communities. There's processing community, open framework, Cinder. There's sort of the more data viz -y type folks, um, the people who are, you know, doing more sort of experimental tech hacks, um, maybe more uh, interactive installation, exhibition design, um, all sorts of different approaches. Um, I think what unites them is um, a sort of researcher-like mentality where they're really sort of um, on the frontiers of uh, creatively engaging with technology um, and probing about what is possible um, what this technology means, how it might be implemented um, in a creative cultural capacity. Um, I think that some of the tools and techniques that are developed in this world are then sort of making their way into popular culture. Um, um, but that application is something that um, is going to happen once and it's going to happen again and will then spread and sort of proliferate through our culture as kind of a new um, a new visual language, a new interactive language that just propagates itself throughout as that technology has inherent biases in it um, and it is designed by people who are making certain choices when they design it and those choices have the ability to influence your behaviors in the way because they you know set up these these constructs that then determine the way that we use the technology and the way that we think about that technology um, and it's important for technology to be open because people have the ability to be empowered and to dive into it and to A, understand how the technology works and B, uh, reappropriate it, take it apart, change it, make alternatives to the, the tools that they have been given. Um, and then it, it puts the power back into the people's hands and so they don't have to be passive consumers of the technology. They have the ability to impact it and change it and um, exert their own particular World view on it, and I think that's important because, you know, as it is changing so rapidly, if we just take things at face value, without um, thinking about, well, okay, how would we make this better? What's wrong with this tool? What can we do to tweak it and change it? And maybe that changed tool is going to be the thing that gets adopted moving forward, as opposed to the flawed version that we were handed down. Um, ego aspect too, because if you publish um, some sort of applet that then uh, 10 other people use and then like 
five other people adapt, um, you kind of get like cred in the scene because people are using your stuff and you've made something that is not only useful for people but also interesting and exciting to them. So um, there is an element of ego to it as much as it is sort of altruistic in a way. Um, um, I think the nature of this work, because it is so technically complex, um, it has to be collaborative. So you can't really uh, be as egotistical anymore. You can't be that solitary artist sitting in a garret, like that cliche stereotype that everybody quotes, um, because you're not likely to get very far that way. Um, you need the work of other people in order to advance as fast as the technology is advancing. Because if you know you were sitting in your room trying to hack away at this connect um, by yourself, uh, chances are it would take you like 10 times as long to develop um, what you guys have been able to develop um, as it has by working within a community. Mm -hmm. um, how does this work fit into sort of a larger context? Like what is it saying that's bigger than the work itself? Um, which to me is important that it that it has some sort of um, value that it's adding to a, a bigger conversation. Um, um, I mean, personally, I'm somebody who's really interested in aesthetics. It doesn't mean it has to be beautiful, but at least um, have some sort of uh, aesthetic vision that it's putting forth into the world like glitch art can be beautiful too um, um, a lot of what's being said is um, talking about uh, falling in love with coding and yeah I think it's a lot of uh, people's sort of personal stories about how they came to be doing what they're doing and what about technology sort of drew them into this world, what um, what sort of capabilities it revealed to them and how it empowered them. Because I think ultimately that's what it does for a lot of these people. What is the role? Um, I think there's artists who are looking at um, the vast outpouring of lives online. Um, in, in an ideal world, um, it would make us more compassionate towards other humans. It would make us, um, you know, more um, willing to, to care about what's happening on the other side of the world, um, more willing to work together towards meeting a common goal. Uh, one of the things that I really love about these communities is the generosity that they engender. And I don't just see that in the open source communities, but I see that happening with sites like Kickstarter, for instance. Uh, seeing that this interconnectedness enables that feeling of kinship among people where they're able to be so much more generous, um, not just financially, but um, with their knowledge, with their um, emotions. Um, and hopefully that's what it's going towards, a, a greater sort of generosity and goodwill amongst people. Um, I think what draws me to this work is uh, looking at the artists and designers who are trying to locate the human within technology, um, looking at these new tools and services that come out and thinking about how they affect us on uh, a humanistic level, on an interpersonal level, um, how they're impacting our behaviors, um, our social exchanges, um, the way that we interact with our environments, the way that we conceive of ourselves in our bodies and in, in space. Um, because with technology moving as fast as it is, um, I feel like somebody needs to take the time to think about, like, no, wait, what is it doing to us as people? 
Um, and artists and designers, I think, are uh, most adept to do that because that's kind of what they think about. Um, they think about, you know, our human experience. Um, and there was a, a group of uh, two artists, one German, one Italian, who stole a million Facebook uh, profiles. They just kind of downloaded them and created this fake dating service where they were matching these people up to one another um, totally randomly. Nobody, none of these people knew that that their identities were being used on this fake dating service. Um, but that's one way that you know they're really critiquing um, the the way that we sort of put our information out there and don't really think about what it means. Um, important because the the question of who owns the internet is something that nobody really thinks about. You know, it's this thing that people just take for granted as free and out there. Um, but then looking at the corporate powers that are actually controlling that um, is something that for the average person is probably a revelation, as he was describing. But it's something that is really necessary for us to be conscious of. Um, um, I think the first thing that I think about is um, how the work impacts me on a visceral level. So whether that's visual or sonic um, or some other sensory impulse um, and, and how that makes me feel. Um, you know, what is it doing that's new and interesting? The new and interesting part is kind of less important, I think. You don't always have to be using a new technique. Um, for the blog, it's something that we do think about because obviously we want to showcase new developments. Um, but I don't think that that necessarily makes a work better or worse. Um, um, emotional impact is something that I think a lot of artists and designers overlook. Um, but it's something that is really important to me. I think um, great work makes you feel something. Um, and yeah, that's, that's something that I personally hold in, in very high regard. Um, I think the medium of our time is digital technology. And that can mean working with uh, software and hardware. Um, that can mean working with um, you know, the, the internet, um, doing everything from performative pieces on Twitter and Facebook to uh, creating some sort of uh, work of web-based net art to um, creating interactive experiments or um, new filmmaking tools. Um, but I think the medium of our time in, is and always has been technology. It's just that now we have a lot more technology at our disposal. Mm. I mean, um, it's easy to feel isolated in your uh, emotions. Like, I'm the only person who has ever felt this way. On the internet, there's this outpouring of feelings that happens every day, people expressing themselves. Um, and a project like We Feel Fine, assembles all of that in this very um, beautiful interface that I think uh, accurately um, creates a representation of these emotions, but also accumulates them in one place so that you can see that you're part of this much greater whole. Um, and that feeling... Um, it's allowed me to connect with people that I would have never had access to, um, didn't even know I wanted to connect with necessarily, and to uh, maintain those relationships at a distance um, over periods of time um, where you're not necessarily engaging with that person on a daily basis or even on a weekly basis or sometimes even on a monthly basis. But you feel in some way tethered to them based on shared interests, um, a great conversation that transpired once or twice, um, just a mutual admiration for one another's work in general. And that connection is really important in and of itself. 
um, and creates a different kind of bond that maybe isn't as deep as the kind of uh, bonds that you sh create and share with like your closest friends who you hang out with all the time, um, but is important nonetheless. Um, friends like this, like there's a lot of people who I have followed or have known online through social media for, you know, two, three years, um, who I'm meeting for the first time, and I have this deep sense of affinity with them that was established exclusively via social media. And that's not to say that, like, we're going to be immediate bosom buddies when we meet, but um, we have a connection that's much deeper than, you know, what would have otherwise been possible, mm. I think.